for coming. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be on the Rosicrucian Science of Initiation. Uh, some of you are new to me and some of you I know from previous events. And what's different about tonight's event is we're really going to be focusing on trying to give a sense of the Rosicrucian system of initiation. There are many different spiritual systems in the world that have different types of initiation programs that a person goes through. And the Rosicrucian system is one that's been very influential in the West, but actually it's sometimes hard to get information about what their actual system of development is. So we're going to try to present that tonight. You might have noticed that we have around in various locations some of the classical depictions of initiation processes coming from European alchemy and from the Rosicrucian tradition. And these often present in an allegorical form the different types of stages one goes through for spiritual development. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Robert Gilbert. I've been involved in Rosicrucian studies for about 25 years. Uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps in the mid-80s, I began an intensive search of different spiritual traditions and was particularly fascinated by European Rosicrucianism and the work of Rudolf Steiner. And having looked into many, many different Rosicrucian groups and teachers, it's my personal opinion that Rudolf Steiner's work is the most advanced Rosicrucian work ever to be made publicly available. There's, of course, always this uh, hidden stream of Rosicrucianism that winds through Western European history. But for something that actually broke the surface and there was a public teaching of, it's really Rudolf Steiner's work that went into some of the deeper waters. So first thing we want to talk about tonight with this concept of the Rosicrucian science of initiation is what do we actually mean by initiation or an initiate? Because the terms are used very generally in modern metaphysical circles. But if you look at people that are being presented as initiates, they are often extremely different. One technical part of this is actually the structure of their consciousness and the structure of their subtle bodies can be quite different from one to another, although they're being presented as initiates within different systems. So one of the discernment points that we have within the Rosicrucian system is that there are three different aspects of initiation or becoming an initiate. In one of these, what is actually being illuminated begins with the thinking process, with actually knowing about non-physical realities, knowing about the greater spiritual realities that we come from, and the spiritual depths of oneself. This is linked to the spiritual centers inside the head. And this is also linked to the illumination of the thinking process, so that with this process we actually know consciously the structure of the spiritual worlds, how we interact with them, how they influence us on a daily basis. And within this Rosicrucian system, that would technically be known as an initiate, someone that actually understands the systems. And that's one reason why you find in so much of the classical depictions all these presentations of different types of patterns, one pattern within another, often represented within sacred geometric forms. And within Western Europe, often sacred geometric forms that hold inside of them Hebrew letters that are a representation of certain states of consciousness, spiritual beings, things of that kind. This is because in this path of illumination, we find that everything is a thought form from the mind of God. And all those thought forms have a pattern to them. And the current term that we use for understanding those patterns is sacred geometry. So sacred geometry is a universal science for understanding the patterns of creation at every level, whether it's how the different spirituals are constructed, or different ranks of spiritual beings and their consciousness, or the different subtle bodies of a human being, whatever it claims is a pattern to it. And so no matter what tradition you study with, they will work with sacred geometry. Because the sacred geometry at the highest level is a pure, packed thought form from the mind of God that shows you the pure pattern of everything that's manifested from it. Now the next level is that of the clairvoyant. And from one perspective, we could say this is linked to the illumination of the heart and the feeling life. The Rosicrucians talk about a process in, within an initiation in which at a certain point, when the heart becomes open and unarmored, and we cultivate this feeling of unconditional love, there is a ignition of a kind of spiritual spark within the heart. And what happens then is that they describe it as an etheric rose light arises from the heart and moves up to what's commonly called the third eye center. And with that rose etheric stream, it enters into the centers in the head, that area that is technically at the third ventricle of the brain and was known as the cave of Brahma in the Indian teachings 
This is a particular area that's open in the head that has a space between the pineal and pituitary glands. And as this space becomes illuminated, it leads to direct spiritual vision. This is then a clairvoyant. The clairvoyant can actually perceive non-physical realities. But depending upon the individual, they may not consciously understand the structures or discern the different things that they are actually seeing. And again, they might be different from some of the other stages that we'll talk about in a moment. So the third aspect here is that there's also the cultivation of action or of the will. And this is linked to the belly, or what in Japan they call the hara, or in Chinese alchemy they call the lower dantian, the lower will centers here. And through the action or willing form of illumination, one is able to take action esoterically. You're able to actually use non-physical realities to change things on the physical plane. Now, at the most extreme form of this, we have things like actual physical alchemy and the transmutation of one physical substance to another. But this is usually attained after going through multiple steps of being able to transform something that is less dense. And that is normally uh, etheric energy fields. So the actual vibrational transformation of energy fields, energy healing, things of that kind, is something that you find very strongly on this path. So the person that can actually transform things using spiritual forces is referred to as the adept. Now again, this is kind of an ideal type of the different aspects of initiations or initiates. Often people have different parts of this in their own particular configuration and are stronger in one aspect or another. But that gives us a bit of an overview for how this fits together. Now everything we're going to go over tonight is to give a straight, logical uh, progression through some of the key knowledge of how the Rosicrucians understand and practice initiation. But all these things could be approached from other angles as well. So just to give you a sense of that, there's a reason why we're emphasizing the head, the heart, and the hara. When you study classical spiritual text, you find that they divide up the aspects of the human being into different types of forces. So the actual consciousness of the human being is often referred to as the astral body. And it's related to what's often called the spiritual plane of the astral plane. Within the Rosicrucian work, you find at a certain point that the consciousness body of the human being has three centers that can be worked on and awakened. And those three centers are around the head, the heart, and the hara. And this is really a universal teaching. If you study with the Buddhist, they'll talk about the uh, thought, speech, and action. If you study with Sufis, they'll talk about the head, the heart, and the hands. All these different traditions are working with the same concept. If you studied Chinese medicine or Chinese internal alchemy like Qi Kung, you'll know that they have the upper, middle, and lower Dan Tian. They refer to these as elixir fields, because when we understand what these actually are energetically, they are a kind of spiritual elixir field that we can work in and illuminate the forces of. So depending on where we focus on primarily, we can first begin to develop the capacity of understanding things in a conscious manner, the patterns behind them, become the initiate, or directly perceive spiritual realities, the clairvoyant, or directly manipulate the spiritual forces, hopefully for a good outcome, and that's the adept. Now for tonight's talk, I'm going to ask if people would hold any questions till the very end, and uh, we'll have a time for questions and answers. But I want to try to go through a particular logical thought path here to try to put a few pieces together. Now, the challenge of explaining some of the more obscure aspects of Rosicrucian spiritual initiation is that some of the practices really don't make a lot of sense until you understand the context that they're within. So we have to present a little bit of the Rosicrucian view of the context of all created life and for the evolution of the human being. Now, first thing I would say about the Rosicrucian tradition is that the Rosicrucian tradition is one of the most recent of the great traditions on the planet. If you go back to the Vedic tradition in India, Tibetan tradition, etc., many others, they're very ancient. But the Rosicrucian tradition really only broke the surface in human history in the 1600s. The first Rosicrucian documents appeared in the 1600s uh, with texts like Fama Fraternitatis in 1604 in Germany. Now, when these Rosicrucian texts first became available,